From cleaning wounds to repelling plague, lavender has had a myriad of uses throughout the centuries and is now quite a common garden plant in the UK. It's come to represent devotion, purity, luck, cleanliness, compassion, constancy, faith, humility and love. Yet in the Victorian language of flowers, it also meant distrust. It was actually ancient Arabia that first farmed the plant and distilled its oils, but it was the Romans that brought it to England. And they even named lavender after their word meaning to bathe, lavare. The Romans steeped bundles of the herbs in their bathing water and then thus spread its use throughout Europe through their bathhouses. So we're going to explore some of the folklore of lavender via its appearance in ancient folklore, medicinal uses and even its magical uses in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are continuing the floral theme for March, because obviously here in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the time of year when more plants start to pop up and so on. So we have, of course, been enjoying the daffodils, the snowdrops and the crocuses here in the northeast throughout March. I hope that you've had a good week since the last episode. In fact, it was actually my birthday on Monday, so I got to spend my morning listening to bell ringing at the cathedral while doing silversmithing. It really was quite cool combining the two. And I got a whole bunch of new books about poisonous plants. So I expect that we're going to have some more poisonous plant folklore on Fabulous Folklore in the very near future. But back to this week's episode. I did make the decision to move to lavender though, because unlike a lot of the plants that I cover, which tend to be incredibly toxic, lavender is a really useful plant. And also there's quite a lot of scientific evidence, which actually also demonstrates its efficacy as well. So I thought that would be a good thing to include, because obviously we do have a lot of medicinal stuff on the podcast as well. That being said, lavender does pop up in ancient history and the Bible. And according to some sources, Cleopatra actually used the fragrance of lavender in her grand seductions. And it is claimed that the asp that killed her hid among her lavender bushes, but I kind of imagine that will be a little bit difficult to prove. So that's what it says, whether it's true or not, I'll leave it up to you. That being said, there is a link with ancient Egypt because when Howard Carter opened Tutankhamun's tomb, he found lavender that still bore traces of its fragrance, which is pretty impressive. Then, of course, we do move over to the Bible. And during the episode when a woman washes Jesus' feet, the lotion that she actually applies apparently contains lavender. Now, I did also read some sources that said it contains spikenard, which is a different plant. But some people like to claim it was lavender. And indeed, lavender would make sense. There are actually links with both Mary and Jesus as to where lavender got its scent from because Mary apparently hung Jesus's swaddling clothes on a lavender bush to dry, which is very, very common practice. And then this apparently transferred his scent to the plant, which is where we get the scent from. Lavender then came to represent cleanliness and purity as a result. Although, as we saw in the introduction, the Romans had already been using lavender in their bath water for quite some time. Now, as I said at the beginning, one of the important uses of lavender is in medicinal reasons. And Nicolette Perry, in a discussion that she actually wrote about lavender for Healthline, described lavender as being a queen of medicinal plants. And she does point out that there is abundant scientific evidence to show that lavender can calm, help sleep, boost mood and memory, relieve pain, heal skin and act as a protective agent, among others. Now, the essential oil possesses antiseptic properties and apparently it can even, and I quote, kill typhoid, diphtheria, streptococcus and pneumococcus bacteria, end quote. And it did find use as an antiseptic during the First and Second World Wars. And there are lots of apocryphal tales about people finding that actually putting lavender oil on burns helped them heal a lot quicker, which is another useful use of lavender, which has actually been proven. And in days gone by, obviously before people had scientific ways of testing if something worked, people would burn bunches of dried lavender and then leave them to smolder in sick rooms to help fumigate the room. And of course, people would also use sachets containing the dried herb to keep pests away from clothes. And indeed, King Charles VI of France apparently used lavender stuffed cushions in his palace in 1387. Some people think this was because he wanted to deter moths. Other people think it was just because of the scent. I kind of can't help thinking it was probably a bit of a mixture of the two. 
So that's quite Im impressive to see a French royal using lavender so early on. Now, this multi-purpose plant actually aids healing and also works as an insecticide, which would explain why people were using it to deter moths. And Abbess Hildegard of Bingen in 12th century Germany apparently used it to kill both fleas and head lice. And interestingly, clinical studies have shown that when applied topically, lavender does help to treat lice and fleas. So clearly, Hildegard of Bingen was really, really ahead of her time. Now, other people mix lavender oil with turpentine to rub into stiff joints. And lavender oil was also apparently used for palpitations, spasms, colic, dispelling flatulence, boosting appetite and guarding against fainting. And all of that comes from our Herb Garden, the website. And if you want to see any of these references, please do check out the blog post for this episode. Meanwhile, midwives would also give pregnant women bunches of lavender during labour so that when they gripped the sprigs, it would release the scent and then give them courage now, we obviously shouldn't use lavender as a panacea because when used topically, it can irritate sensitive skin and regular use can also disrupt hormones as well. So it's really important not to overuse any oils. And also please consult your physician if you're pregnant or breastfeeding before you use lavender oil. Otherwise, it is, to be fair, one of the safer ones and is often used quite easily in things like aromatherapy or massage as well. Now, I personally use lavender. And it is one of the three ingredients in my homemade massage oil. I do also use it in essential oil rollers. And it is brilliant at taking the edge off a tension headache. And this is probably, and this does have a bit of a precedent since putting lavender oil on the temples or drinking lavender tea was believed to uh, treat headaches. Now, in Mediterranean countries, people avoided sunstroke by weaving lavender into their hats. And it is more likely that the hats probably kept the sun at bay so they didn't get headaches. But obviously keeping lavender so close would be a nice way to spend the day. And also we're back to Abbess Hildegard of Bingen again. She mixed lavender with brandy and gin to make a migraine cure. Now Thomas Culpepper actually recommended it for both physical and emotional ailments. And this is the other really important way that lavender has been used. And its gentle scent has become quite famous for its ability to help improve symptoms of depression. Now, obviously, if you've ever suffered from depression, you'll probably be sitting there going, yeah, I really don't think that lavender is going to help. But it does have quite a calming effect in a lot of ways. And I would also argue if you then mix that with sweet orange, the scent of that helps to boost mood as well. And I am speaking as someone who knows. So I'm not just repeating things I've seen on the Internet. Now, controlled scientific trials have shown that lavender lowers anxiety and promotes calm in those with generalised anxiety disorder. And in fact, according to Perry, its results are actually comparable to conventional drugs for anxiety. One controlled study actually showed it was comparable to paroxetine, which is used to treat depression. So that is really, really impressive. And obviously it doesn't have all the horrible side effects of paroxetine either. And indeed, one old treatment actually involved infusing lavender flowers in boiling water and then inhaling the scent to relieve mental gloom. And I think in a lot of ways, this probably explains why Margaret Baker makes the claim that lavender was said to make lions and tigers docile because it was apparently supposed to have an effect on them when they were kept near lavender in zoos. I mean, I'm not sure I want to be the one to try that one out. But obviously, the other advantage of lavender is it does attract bees. So it is quite great if you want to make a bee friendly garden. And it's also a fairy favourite as well. So actually growing your own lavender can certainly help to boost your mood just simply through the practice of gardening. Now, the other thing that I'm, I'm laughing just because this is absolutely brilliant, this bit, that lavender like appears in perfume. We've talked about using it for aromatherapy reasons and things like that. But, but there is a bit of a strange backstory as to how lavender appeared in perfume. And basically, to find out why, we've got to head to Marseille. And four grave robbers were plundering graves during a plague outbreak. When they were caught, they claimed that they'd used lavender to protect them against contracting the disease. And obviously, if you heard that, you would be a bit like, I'm sorry, what? But that is indeed what they said. Now, if you're interested, their portion also contained rosemary, distilled vinegar and cloves. And such a mixture is often called four thieves vinegar. Other recipes say that it contained garlic. Now, I would pay good money to see an advert for that at Christmas, possibly starring Brad Pitt, but I digress. So the idea behind it is they were robbing graves and they're not contracting plague. And when they were caught, they explained it was because of the vinegar. And some sources say that they actually got more lenient sentences because they shared the recipe. But there is an alternative version that said that the thieves actually invented the potion after they'd been sentenced to bury plague corpses. So they'd invented four thieves vinegar to try and stave off 
the plague. And basically, either way, whether it's that version or the fact that already being Grave Robin, the intention is the same, to use lavender to stave off the plague. But in 1709, Italian perfumer Giovanni Maria Farina moved to Cologne. He used the tale as inspiration and then added lavender to his new scent, Eau de Cologne, and thus a really famous scent was born. And this use of lavender within the vinegar perhaps explains why lavender also came to represent distrust, self-preservation and thievery in various versions of the language of flowers. Now we are going to make a bit of a leap from plague to love, because why not? Because lavender has long been associated with love and romance, as well as four thieves vinegar. And this association with love and romance does in some part help to explain the famous rhyme, Lavender's green, dilly dilly, lavender's blue. You must love me, dilly dilly, cause I love you. I mean, we'll ignore the overarching sentiments of entitlement in that rhyme there, but this does obviously show that there's been this long running link between love and romance and lavender. Now, Tudor girls actually made lavender tea to help them see their future husbands, and they would drink it before bed, asking St. Luke to bring a vision of their true love in their dreams. And there is also some recommendations that you could scent your clothes with lavender to help attract love as well. Girls hid sprigs of the plant under the pillows of their beloved to help them think loving thoughts and it possibly explains why newlyweds stuffed lavender into their mattresses to help encourage marital bliss and people also used to give sprigs of lavender to newlyweds to bring them luck. Obviously if I'm going to be a little bit narky about it then I can't help thinking that obviously you're giving people something that smells lovely and helps to reduce sort of irritability and so on and helps to boost calm so I can't help thinking that there may have actually been like an aromatherapy reason as to why the marital bliss and the look and so on was was coming rather than it just simply being like the magical properties of lavender but there we go now girls would actually carry the plant to help ward off unwanted advances which is a bit confusing if people were then using it to attract love as well and married women would then use it to help inflame their husband's passions but just to add further confusion Sex workers used it to attract customers, but they also used it because they believed that the plant guarded against cruelty. So that is quite a lot of mixed messages from a single plant. Now, there have been no studies that actually investigate the ability of lavender to help with social bonding or romance. So we will just have to make do with anecdotal evidence. But obviously it wouldn't be a folklore episode without also looking at the magical uses of lavender. And one recipe advises that you mix it with mugwort, chamomile and rose to attract fairies, elves and brownies on Midsummer's Eve. Or again, you can use it as a tea to increase your clairvoyance, which could perhaps tie in with the idea of girls drinking lavender tea to try and dream of who their future husband would be. Hanging a cross of lavender over the door stopped evil from coming into the home. And obviously, if you are interested in home protection folklore style, then you can get the guide that I wrote to it. Obviously, please still use the burglar alarm by signing up for my email list at the link below. And it says, I grab your free guide or something in the show notes. But also wearing sprigs of lavender kept children immune from the evil eye. And people in Spain and Portugal would throw lavender into bonfires on St. John's Day to ward off evil spirits. And there's one really cool belief that says that if you inhale lavender scent, it gives you the power to see ghosts. And I'm like, that is the next Hollywood franchise that I would pay good money to see. You could also use lavender in spells for boosting brain power or to encourage fertility. Although I would obviously say if you're trying to boost brain power, add a little bit of rosemary for for a little bit extra oomph. And then you could also mix lavender with basil, lemon balm, thyme, rue and frankincense. And if you do use it as a powdered incense, you could burn the mixture in your house to protect your home. Or indeed, you can then mix the oils and wear it as a protective scent. But please do make sure that you mix them in a base oil like coconut oil or almond oil so you don't end up with a chemical burn. So lavender, you can use neat, but a lot of other essential oils you really, really can't. So just make sure you put them in a base oil first. But whatever you do, it really is worth finding a way to bring this wonderful plant into your life. Whether you use the oil to repel headaches or you use the dried herb to deter moths, it is a fantastic plant to keep around. I do actually have a very, very small baby lavender bush in my back garden and I was very impressed by the fact that it essentially got hit by like all of the major storms from Arwen onwards and it's quite happily still growing. So clearly isn't that fussed by extreme weather, which is quite good to know. So I would love to know if you use lavender in your home, if you grow it in your garden, if you use it in an aromatherapy point of view, or indeed if you would like to see the Brad Pitt themed 
Chanel advert for Four Thieves Vinegar, please do let me know. As always, you can tweet me, you can message me on Instagram, you can email me, you can leave a comment on the blog post that this is attached to. If you're listening on YouTube, you can leave a comment at the end of the video, all that kind of jazz. There's loads of ways to get in touch. So please do. Before I go, I will also say that if you are in Newcastle on April the 15th, I am going to be doing a talk at the Black Gate about Easter folklore. So we'll be having a look at things like what have eggs, bunnies, bonnets, parades, hot cross buns, all that kind of thing. What's all that actually got to do with Easter? And it would be lovely to see some of you there if you are available. I am going to finish off this month with lilies. I was going to do fuchsia because I do actually have a blog post on fuchsia, but it's literally about 600 words long. And then I realised there's actually very little folklore about fuchsia. So we're not going to do that. We are going to do lilies instead. And there's a lot more folklore about lilies. So I hope you enjoy that. And we are basically, as a result, back to poisonous plants again. And let's be honest, would you expect anything less from me? As always, if you want any extra content, you can always check out my Patreon where you can get things like exclusive little mini episodes where I just simply tell you a short folk tale in like five to seven minutes. There's the bonus episodes where you get like a full length or often much longer episode, in, which is a bit of a deep dive into a longer topic. So the episode for February was about Rosalind Chapel and its mysteries. So take a look at my Patreon and see if any of the benefits catch your fancy because obviously anyone who does support the podcast does basically help me to keep it going. So that's always nice. But anyway, I will leave you to get on with whatever it was you were doing before you started listening to this. I hope you have a marvellous week ahead and I will see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next. Mm-hmm.